Hey everybody, Alex here, SteelersDepot.com for your weekly, bi-weekly I should say, Monday Steelers live stream as we are talking about a win here, Pittsburgh getting their third victory of the season 2010 over the New Orleans Saints on Sunday to move to 3-6 and six on the year. As always, here answering your Steelers questions for the next hour. Just me tonight, Dave, is away he had an appointment so he's unable to make it so you guys will be stuck with me for the next hour um as always if you could just let me know from an audio perspective if things sound okay they should but if not then we'll fix that and then we will get started with your questions right away so just let me know and then uh we will get started and appreciate you guys being here again reminder if you want to have a guarantee of your question being asked and answered, you can uh, send it through a super chat and you will move to the front of the line. And if not, that's totally cool. No obligation to do so. So thank you, Tim. And thank you, Mike, for uh, telling about the audio. And we should be good to go. And I uh, do want to point you guys to some... Normally, sometimes Dave and I sort of uh, bag on, on Ben's podcast a little bit. It's not a bad podcast. It just creates a lot of work to... To do, but he had a really good interview posted yesterday, actually, with Heath Miller, just telling old stories about their time together, which was a lot of fun. So um, check out the articles on Steelers Depot, and there's links to the uh, actual interview as well. But that out of the way, let's get to your questions from Mutated Genome. Says, hello, Alex and Dave. Who contributed mostly to the Steelers' successful running game yesterday? Did the O-line do their job better, or did Najee do his better? Is the answer yes. The answer is yes. Um, Still working through the tape. I began with a defensive all-22. I've gone through all of that. I just started with the offense before I came on here, so I haven't really combed through that thoroughly. But whenever you rush for 217, your O-line and your run game breaks out the way that it broke out, it's a combination of things. And, And to me, that was really a true collective rushing attack. It wasn't, you know, one guy running for 200 of that 217. Nobody was over 100 yards. Najee at 99. You had Kenny Pickett scrambling. You had Jalen Warren, receiver run game, uh, Pickens with a 22-yard run and a touchdown. Not a bad day at the office for him. So the O-line did their job. I thought Mason Cole blocked well in the middle, but I think collectively um, you got second-level help. You got receivers getting involved. You talk about the Pickens run I just referenced for 22. You got Deontay Johnson blocking downfield. You see Kenny Pickett not throwing a block, but trying his best to race downfield. And Najee Harris is 36 yard run. So um, it, it to me really, really was a total team effort. Lumberzack94 says, Hey there, Lone Wolf Alex. Uh, Arthur Millette is limited, but played the slot well this season. If it were up to you, would you re-sign him on a cheaper deal or spend more and try to go after Mike Hilton? Well, Hilton's under contract for a while, and so is Millette. Millette is signed through 2023, so he will be um, contractually on the roster next year, and I imagine the team will want to have him and see what he can do. He has played better. His role has grown as well. It used to be where he was, and Tomlin still references this, the early down slot corner, first down, second down, obvious run situations. Recently, in part due to some injuries, but even when the group was generally healthy minus Mika yesterday, I mean, they, okay, I shouldn't say generally healthy, but they had options. Um, they were keeping Millette on the field, even in dime and, and sub packages and, and two minute drills and things like that. Uh, they could have, and they had the ability to put Trey Norwood there, which they have done in the past, or bump Cam Sutton inside and say play James Pierre outside. They chose neither of those options. And so um, I think Millette's role has grown a bit and he played well in coverage on the kick coverage team as well but had that great third down uh breakup on the slot fade to chris will have a great fight to rip that ball on the way down and really just did not give up on that play and you know millette's a good energy guy i mean i, I love watching millette uh, uh, here's here's how i'll say about um millette i like watching him as much on the sideline as i do on the field and that's a compliment not a, a knock because this guy has so much energy I watch him after Jalen Warren's run end of the game to see Let Millette ripping his you know big jacket he has on off and he's running with Warren and having fun. I see this guy, he'll sit on the bench and if somebody makes a play, he races up off the bench and, and goes to help the player up or celebrate with him. Just a really good glue guy. So I've had a lot of fun watching Arthur Millette. Double HH with a very generous $20 super chat. So thank you for that. And thank you for your support as always says, 
I am also flying solo tonight watching the kids alone. We still have so many holes to fill next season. If you could rank the top seven needs as of mid-November 2022, what order would they be? I probably won't give you a $20 answer to that question, so I apologize. I mean, trying to rank anything right now when things float and change so much is tough to do. I, I don't generally have a running list of things because you're just kind of in the season, and whenever whenever the season ends, you can really step back and think and process the totality of a year. Um, obviously, trench play, I think, will be a big focus uh, for this team, offensive line, defensive line, probably more primarily when it comes to the O-line left side. Uh, left guard is probably where I would personally start. Left tackle, if you could find a stud, you know, say a first-round pick, a top-10 pick, maybe. Um, I could be okay with, with more, but I want to watch more, excuse the pun, of Dan Moore um, and, and learn more about his game as a second-year guy who has grown but still has work to do. Defensive line, just because of the age, and you got so many guys hitting for agency, and Okunjobi, all those almost certainly going to retire. Chris Wormley for agent after this year as well. You're going to need to add some pieces there. Um, Cam Hayward, another year older, those kinds of things. Beyond that, I mean, you know, I would love to get a true number one corner, but so would everybody else who does not have a true number one corner. And inside linebacker, what happens with with Bush, Terrell Edmonds is strong safety. Those are pending for Asians. So um, those are some positions, some obvious ones probably off the top. But I, I really couldn't give you a list or maybe seven laid out for you there. Double HH. Next question comes from Mike Adesso. Uh, what's up with Jax? Why even dress him? He had to be a tweak in warm-ups, right? No, Tomlin didn't say that. Um, he just said that, you know, they, they like Splain and that Jack was limited in practice, and so it, it didn't feel like there was any sort of, of tweak, but just that, you know, they, they had Splain ready to go, and they felt like he was more prepared and, you know, wasn't de- dealing with the injury, so um, give Jack some extra time there. I guess it's kind of the way that... That turned out, and because this defense is only on the field for 49 total plays, 45 of which counted, uh, there really was no reason or, or need to put Jack on the field. So just uh, being conservative, I guess, was the idea, and I, and I like Spillane a lot. And, and overall, I thought Spillane, you know, not great in coverage, but but played well and thought the defense communicated well, and Spillane plays a big role in that. Ross Swisher, how come this team hasn't been able to consistently run block like they did last night, even after three years? It's a really good question. Uh, it's probably hard to give a you know one sentence answer to that. I think you've seen a lot of change with the offensive line, both in personnel and in coaching. Three offensive line coaches in three years, a lot of shuffling from you know where this unit was, say in 2020 or 2019, compared to where it is today. Total transformation, a core for basically the the veteran. Uh, most tenured guy of that group, and he's 25 years old. I mean, he came in as a young guy out of college. I get that, but kind of just tells you where this team is at. So when you have so many different pieces and a big transformation along the line, new coaches every year, literally, uh, and just a change in the offense overall, change in OC, you know, last year, those kinds of things, probably hard to to get consistency. And you're just trying to find probably some more uh, more talent and, and figure out what you have. But But obviously... Uh, this run game has to build on what it did yesterday. Not that you would expect this team to rush for 217 every single time, but it's got to be more than just a one-off thing. They can't have a 40-yard a performance against the Bengals on Sunday. Otherwise, it feels like you're, you're back to square one. If you guys could also like the stream, I would really appreciate that. That helps bring more people in for the stream and for the channel. Um, it's been a slower time right now because of the bye week, so I'd really appreciate if you guys could just uh, hit that like button. I know that's so... So cliche and so hacky to for a YouTuber to say that, but uh, that does really help out a lot in the YouTube algorithm. Raged EA2, hey Alex, just wanted to let you know you're you're the reason I became a Phoenix Suns fan in 2019. The return on investment has been amazing. Just wish they could finish the job. Well, thank you for that. I don't know what I did. I know I am a Suns fan during that. Um, you know this. Um, who was the coach before Monty Williams, the the guy with the, the name that was hard to pronounce, um, you know, the Dragon Bender era and things like that. But I don't know what influence I had to really compel you there, but but you're welcome. And yeah, hopefully this is the year, but these finals have been been a little tough to watch. These playoffs, the uh, the Mavs game last year, Game 7, ugly. Jason says, uh, hello, Dolores and Brittany, I mean Daleks. That's uh, the old uh, inside joke there. Hey, Jason. 
what would y'all do with a safety situation for next season with both KZ and Terrell Edmonds being for Asians? Would you try to keep both if affordable? I would, thanks. You haven't really given any firm answers on that. Um, I'd be open to either guy. I know Case is getting older and has had some injuries, but like his energy, like his play overall, and Edmonds has been you know, generally who he is, but small progressions, I think, every single year. His run defense, his tackling has been much better this year than last year, and he's just a very available, well-conditioned, all-situations kind of guy. I mean, he play, whenever he plays, he's playing essentially every single snap and on special teams. Some gunner, or not, not gunner, but jump, jammer work and you know, field goal block and things like that. So, um, you know, he's a guy that plays as much as anybody on this team. So depending on price tag and things like that, yeah, I would. Now, would I also consider some some younger options, some some longer term options? Sure, potentially. Um, but you don't want to necessarily go into the draft with a big hole at strong safety. Remember, this team signed Edmonds uh, right before last year, this past year's draft, and then Casey hours after the draft ended to give himself some veteran options um, there. So short answer, yeah, I'd entertain, but I, I don't know on price tag, and I don't know exactly where I'm at sitting here today for the end of the year. Tim, can you explain why they allowed the Saints uh, tight end to get open time and time again on that drive before the half? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a two-minute drill, and that's a good tight end. That's Juwan Johnson. He's a former receiver. He ran 4-5 out of the combine, and they balked him up, and he's playing tight end, but but he can move. He's athletic. Um, some of that was Pittsburgh playing two-man, and, and, and so what the Saints are doing, running some option routes or some out routes. So when you play two-man, the route you kind of, tend to allow the most are the outbreaking routes, the outs and, and comebacks and things like that. You're playing inside hip. So some of that happened. Um, they got into a rhythm, and, and that's you know pretty typical for uh, two-minute situations like that. And on the touchdown, I, I put that on Levi Wallace. That's quarters. That's cover four. Wallace has the deep quarter there to the pylon, and he kind of cheated inside, and uh, they hit Johnson behind. I would not put that on, on Robert Splain. Maybe he could have gotten a bit more depth, but... I certainly would put that a lot more on Levi Wallace than uh, Roberts Blank. Uh, let's see. Can we afford to keep Casey next year? Yeah, I'm sure they could. They're going to have money, and Casey's not going to cost that much. The guy, this is his first game of the season. I mean, he signed a one-year deal for, for pretty cheap this year. Um, the injury is going to impact his, his value there. We'll see how he plays and what his role is the next, uh, next eight games. But, you know, could they afford it? Sure. Uh, let's see, Hop Lamop, good name, says, I saw that short video Fave posted on Twitter today. Uh, I don't know who Fave is, but says, I can't stop wondering if Canada is really calling the play still. Everybody in the booth seemed to congratulate the man next to Canada. Um, I don't know what you're referring to specifically. The man next to Canada to his immediate right, his name is Matt Tomshow. He's basically been Matt Canada's right-hand man. Everywhere he's been throughout college, they were at like, Northern Illinois together and stuff like that. I very much doubt Tom Show is calling the place. If anybody else is doing that duty, it'd be either be Tomlin, which I don't think it'd be Tomlin. He's doing a lot of the defensive stuff, or Mike Sullivan. So um, I think it's okay to give Canada credit. I don't want to try to deflect that unless there's there's better evidence that uh, some sort of role in, in play calling duty has changed. Nick says, Arthur Millette is one scrappy dude, plays with fire. He does. Yeah, he's a lot of fun to watch, so um, I'm with you there, Nick. Give me just one second to change a setting here. All right. Uh, Mark Miller says, I'm okay with a 6-3 and three finish to the year and 8-9 and nine season, providing we see improvement in Kenny and the offense going into next year versus a high draft pick. Thoughts? Yeah, that's my point. I almost wrote an article on that and just didn't get around to it before the game. I understand the instinct and the the math of it to say, well, you know, wins they're fine, but you're gonna you know hurt your draft pick status. But wins aren't just wins in this you know theoretical vacuum. They 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 mean you played well. That's my my big brain analysis there. So wins generally mean the defense played better, or the run game got better, or maybe Kenny Pickett got better, or George Pickens made plays and stuff like that. They're gonna be tangible things that you can carry over into next year, saying there's optimism at X, Y, and Z. So can never root for this team to lose. I don't, you know, endorse or, or support the tank there. So uh, I, I'm with you, Mark. John Pennington. Hey, John, how you doing? Alex, do you have any idea why Riley hasn't got a chance in the secondary? Um, I mean, 
They've had injuries there. They've been a bit better at safety overall. And then Casey coming back. Had Casey not been available, then Riley may have gotten a couple more opportunities. He played in the Bucks game in Week 6 and some, some dime packages there. So I thought it was weird they elevate him on Saturday and then make him inactive. So they just kind of burn one of those um, three promotions you get or whatever the number is. So I don't know what happened there. If they just wanted to kind of play it safe and see how Casey looked and just kind of reacting in the moment to everything that happened with Minka, I'm not quite sure. But uh, Riley's there. He's there. Uh, Weidel knows him from his time in Philadelphia. Can Tomlin get back to his benchmark 500 season over the next month? I mean, the math says that he could, you know, theoretically, and the schedule is more forgiving, and you're in AFC North games. Um, my prediction was that they would go 4-5 and five over the, the, the next nine games. That was a comment made after the bye week before yesterday's game. I picked Pittsburgh to beat the Saints, so I had them at finishing the year 6-11. and 11. Uh, So to, to get to nine wins, they'd have to go... Seven and two, so I think it's probably asking a bit too much, but we'll see how things go, and we'll take it uh, week by week. Uh, let's see, can we beat the Bengals next week? That is from David Kapoor. Sure, I mean it's you know, I want to say it's impossible. There's no way, no path they could do it. It's AFC North football. It'll be a big challenge. I don't think the Bengals will have Jamar Chase in that game. It doesn't sound like it's early, so I don't want to conclude that. But yeah, I mean you know it's. It's been some, you know, they beat him week one, so why couldn't they beat him again? I guess it's, it's the thought there. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Appreciate you guys asking questions. Keep them coming. You had just me tonight. No Dave. We'll be back for the next stream. Uh, Alex, have you been hit with a draft loop glitch on Madden yet? Uh, no, I have not because I don't play Madden. I am aware of the glitch, and that is one of the many reasons why I never by Madden because their franchise mode is terrible and you have things where your franchise gets stuck with the draft glitch. Uh, some of the YouTubers that I watch, like Mr. Hurricane, I know that he's had some issues, so um, I don't want to be somebody that gets all invested into a series and then the game basically breaks itself. $5 Super Chat from Tim Chase running backwards to lose first downs, killing me. No name there, but I know you're referring to Deontay Johnson and not the first time he's made a decision like that. I understand if he breaks a bunch of tackles, makes guys miss, then it looks great and awesome on a highlight reel. But yeah, that was that was pretty extremely bad. Sometimes if you have, say, you have a 23-yard gain and you, you back up to try to make a guy miss, you get 22. All right, fine, whatever. But to, to re- erase the first down like that, so obviously, so uh, frustratingly, that you know, something has to be addressed there to, to some degree. Let me scroll back up see what else we have again appreciate you guys being here and liking the stream um would help me out a ton next question will come from let's see if i can find one here a lot of commentary which i can appreciate there ross swisher am i wrong alex about trubisky throwing 200 yards in a quarter and Pickett can't even get 200 if it isn't garbage time i mean i remember you asking that a while back and talking about the bucks game um you know trubisky played well coming off the bench there I think sometimes coming off the bench and teams aren't preparing for you and there's a little bit of that aspect to it. Maybe helps these guys occasionally. Um, yeah, I thought Pickett's you know, not played well the last two games. He was pretty bad against the Eagles. I don't think he was very good against the Saints. He did take care of the football. He was better in the second half, I would say, than the first half, but not by a lot. Uh, I think he struggled with some of the sim pressure looks on third down, struggled with accuracy overall, especially early in the first half, and um, still as, you know, did not throw a touchdown pass and still has more uh, rushing touchdowns than than passing touchdowns, which is not where you you want to be there. So uh, still taking it week by week in totality, and we'll talk about the good, talk about the bad. I think right now I've gotten people saying that I love Kenny Pickett than that I hate Kenny Pickett. I'm getting both of those, and that probably means that my commentary's been fair and as unbiased as possible. Scrolling back up here to see what we have uh, for you guys. Uh, can pick it out, run Najee. He was really moving on that play. Yeah, I mean, he was going. I think uh, Seth Walder said his third fastest speed of the season for Pickett at 19.1 miles per hour. Still would love to know exactly what Najee runs. He didn't run uh, when he came out. He probably, what do you guys think Najee Harris runs? If he ran a 40-yard dash, what do you think he would be? Put it in the chat. I would say 4 5 four. I'll, I'll give him right under four five five. So um, I think some there's some 
somebody out there saying he ran like a four four five. I don't think he's a a four four kind of guy, but I, I'll say four five four will be uh be my number for Najee Harris. Double H H says four six. Yeah, I mean that that's probably fair as well. Um, but I think he gets moving a bit. Maybe he gets that that last twenty helps him out a little bit. Uh, Legion of Weeb says four five ish. Tim says four six as well. So yeah, just uh, not that it matters much, but just curious what his forty time would be. What did I think about the Casey penalty? I mean, it looked bad in the NFL these days. If it looks bad, it, it is bad by default, and it gets called. I don't think I've even gone back and watched it again because it is what it is. Um, if there was helmet to helmet contact or not, I know Casey was trying to lead with the shoulder, but you know, with the way they call things, I get it. If that happens to a Steeler, everyone's yelling for for a penalty there. Uh, Todd says four five four six. I basically, seem most people saying four six on on Najee, but generally, I think we all agree between as uh, Todd said four five to to four six. Let's see what else we have here for you guys. Double H H is Liao scheduled to return back this season? I forgot what his injury was. It was never announced by the team other than a knee. Uh, I think I heard meniscus. I want to say so. I believe he. The expectation, the hope is that he would come back. It wasn't a torn ACL or MCL or anything like that where you sit there and go, okay, this guy's not coming back the rest of the year. So, you know, it just depends on how you rehab and how you heal and things like that. But I think you'll see Leal again before the year is done. And it sounds like according to the Post-Gazette that William Jackson is expected to be able to return later this year with that back injury that Pittsburgh has some reason traded for him. Not my favorite trade and doesn't look any better right now. Morgan Bradley, $5 super chat. Thank you for that. Morgan says, I'm worried that if Calvin Austin doesn't play this year, then we won't keep him. I feel that he would be a perfect, he would fit in perfect. And that's from Morgan. Well, they're going to keep him. He's under contract. He signed a four-year deal uh, whenever he got drafted, after he got drafted. And so he'll be in camp next year and hopefully healthy and good to go for uh, OTAs. So we'll see how he looks and revisit him in the summer when I head out to St. Vincent. But uh, he will be a Steeler, uh, barring something dramatic happening, probably off the field, which I'm sure will not happen for 2023. So we'll see how he looks. And obviously, the foot injuries that, that he's been dealing with in the surgery for a guy who runs 4-3-2 and is a small guy, not great, but we'll see how he looks. It's certainly something that he can uh, overcome. All right, let's see what else we have here for you guys. Uh, someone also asking about when is Liao coming back. Don't have an exact date. Uh, in terms of eligibility, I can check when he actually got placed on IR. And you're going to have to miss the four games. I think it's four games and not four weeks after that. I always kind of forget. Uh, that happened October 15th. So, you know, we're a month out from that. You know, when could he return? Maybe call it a month from now, just kind of guessing in terms of another couple weeks to get cleared and then practice and then try to return, and we'll see how it looks uh, in terms of the depth and getting a hat, although I think he probably will. Ladermoke maybe goes in, to an active uh, status again uh, if and when Liao returns. Mike Adesso, I think it's pretty clear that my chat just scrolled, so let me scroll back up and find it for you. I think it's pretty clear Steven Sims is everything that I hope Switzer, Ray Ray, and Gunner to be so much more electric than those guys. Sure would like to see him catch some slants and go. Yeah, I'd like to see him out in space. He's had his best running out there open field. Um, yeah, he's a fun player to watch. I mean, I, I love the story. Two-star recruit. Only FBS offer was Kansas. He wins six total games in his time with the Jayhawks. Undrafted. Makes a team with Washington in 2020 and uh, climbs the ladder in Pittsburgh and, and now has a, a relatively consistent role. So fun guy to, to watch and root for and um, change your direction ability is pretty, pretty impressive. Michael O'Malley, not happy with Tomlin, says, I just can't wait until the franchise realizes we won't sniff the Super Bowl with Tomlin ever again. Time to move on. So Michael O'Malley calling for Mike Tomlin's firing. Uh, let's see... Scrolling back down, 007, Alex, what do you think about the AFC North? Seems like the rest of the division has lost a lot of games. It's getting better. Let me pull up Dave Bryan's uh, AFC North standings here. you got two teams with winning records in the Ravens and the Bengals. It's not as 
strong of a division as I think people thought that it would be. Uh, yeah, Baltimore at six and three. Uh, let's see, Cincinnati five and four. Browns three and six over Pittsburgh with the head-to-head matchup. Steelers, of course, also three and six. Um, but Pittsburgh will have you know more AFC North games to play for them to go, including starting this weekend, week uh, eleven against the Bengals. Uh, I think it's a division getting better. I think you know Baltimore's gotten better. The Bengals had their own two starts, so they're better and. They had to deal with Chase uh, that first game that offense tanked against the Browns. So we'll see. But I'm just kind of focused on Pittsburgh right now. Uh, let's see what else do we have here for you guys. Again, appreciate everybody stopping by and asking questions. I'm here until the top of the hour. Mike Adesso, let's stop for a moment and smile and appreciate an actual successful screen completed yesterday. What a world. Yeah, I'm going to be writing about that. If you're talking about the Steven Sims play, I will be writing about that for uh, the morning. It was a really nicely designed play by Matt Canada. So got to give him a lot of credit. Back to the super chat from Tim Chase. Thank you, as always. Tim Pickens hit out of bounds. Should have been a penalty. Players need to quit trying to jump over people. Um, Is that on... What play are you referring to, Tim? Don't send a super chat for that. That was on the the run, I'm guessing. I don't remember uh, when that, what what uh, play you're talking about specifically, Tim. But uh, you're probably correct. I just don't know exactly uh, which one you're referring to. John, Alex, do you think Kenny is holding the ball a tad too long and needs to get the ball out a little faster? Um, I'd have to check some of the snap to throw times in recent games. I don't. I think the Saints had some good coverage yesterday. I think there probably were times where nothing was there. That's one reason why Pickett was scrambling the way that he did. I just think seeing the field cleanly, I think, off of play action, seeing the field's been an issue. I have a, a clip on Twitter of him with that really bad throw to Pat Fryermuth that um, should have never been thrown. Just don't think he saw the linebacker roboting underneath to take away the, the cross or the bender by Fryermuth. So I think just you know seeing some of the post-snap stuff whenever there's rotation, Whenever there is play action, probably one of the bigger things he has to work on, pocket mobility, presence, another thing he has to work on as well. And some of that is whenever he does, to your point, John, hang on to the football a bit too long. Terry, breed love. You want to win next year and later. Now you are seeing why giving the rookie his starts now, why we rebuild is so important. Yeah, I like to take my lumps now then later and see what you have. Uh, get information on this guy about all these guys, and and so I was good with Pickett playing early. Again, I was somebody that said, start this guy a week one. I thought he was ready. I wanted to see what he could do. Obviously, it's bumpy. You knew it was going to be bumpy for a lot of reasons, but you try to get the bumps figured out now, and if you can't get them figured out, then then you'll you'll know that as well, and you can uh, proceed appropriately. Uh, Let's see. Tim, don't remember time and game was on sideline. Okay, it was probably the rush that he had. Uh, Excuse me, the rush that he had, but I don't know. Uh, for sure. Let me get a drink of water here. I don't I'm not used to talking this much. All right, scrolling back up. And I'll have a video on should be tomorrow afternoon for the channel on TJ Watt and his impact. I'm still kind of working through some of those clips, but uh, of course TJ Watt's impact and value to this defense cannot be stated enough, and you felt that yesterday. Uh, Simon Egolf, uh, why do you think Deontay's production has gone down since Kenny has been starting? Seems like he got a lot more balls from Trubisky. I'd have to check the numbers on that. I don't know uh, the validity to that. It certainly could be true, but I don't know if that's just some of that game to game type stuff and you know what was called and things like that. So I really couldn't tell you too much. Uh, I was happy to see Johnson used on more slants, some more yak. Uh, you know, opportunities for him. That's kind of his wheelhouse the best. And I thought he got, you know, fairly involved and had that good catch on on what was a good throw from Pickett. Certainly give Pickett credit for that 36-yard completion that was a well-thrown ball and a nice grab and finish by Deontay Johnson. So I um, thought he got involved, you know, a fair amount yesterday. Alex, when do we actually revamp this inept coaching staff and when do the Roonies realize coaches need to be paid? That's also for Michael O'Malley. I I think you're looking for I think you're you're probably at talking a bit more rhetorically because I don't have answers for you on that stuff. In terms of the the paid part, 
you know, I've seen that line a lot, and I'm not saying that it's wrong, but I'm asking somebody to present me data on the Steelers coaching staff being underpaid and not spending enough money on coaches. I hear that uh, claim and critique a ton. The, the, the Steelers are cheap. They don't pay coaches. I don't know what they pay coaches. I know Tomlin is one of the higher paid coaches in football. I don't know exactly where he sits in right now. Is it like $10 million or $11 million? Forget the numbers on that, but he's certainly in that top, I think no worse than top five. In terms of the assistants, I don't know what the salaries are. I don't. That's not publicly available, so if somebody wants to point me in that direction, feel free. There's an old uh, story from Dan Rooney that said, uh, you know, we don't pay the most, we don't pay the least, we're on the high side of fair. This is what Rooney said in terms of what they pay coaches. You know, Could that have changed over the years? Certainly, I don't know. Obviously, Pittsburgh does not have you know, big names. They don't have, say, a Dan Quinn as their DC where you assume that guy's getting paid a bunch of money because he's, a you know, a guy in demand, a former coach, a guy with a, a bigger resume. Although, you know, Terrell Austin, you know, is, is a you know, relatively decent name in terms of the, their name recognition of it all. But point is, I don't know the numbers on that stuff, so I don't know if anyone else does as well. And if somebody does, then please let me know. Got a $2 super chat from Legion of Weebs. What positions you drafting with the first three picks? Again, it's hard to really dial that in. For agency, of course, becomes uh, comes before the draft, so that can and often does dictate uh, your approach and what you draft and what uh, the needs are. But trenches, O-line, D-line, and then edge. I think edge is important to address. Obviously, you have Watt and Highsmith, but you got to have a better number three for a rotation. And, of course, as you felt this year, this defense felt this year, losing T.J. Watt, losing either of those guys, Highsmith or, you know, more significantly Watt for an extended period of time. Uh, Mike Tomlin's talked about how the edge group are the engines of this defense. He's right about that, and you better put another cylinder in this defense so you're not running on just one um, if one of those guys goes down. So edge, probably not first round, probably not, but I would say day two, Third round pick, roughly, I'd be comfortable with that. For agency, it's tough to get an edge guy because you got to pay him and he wants to start and play. And you got some guys there already that are starting and playing and, you know, paid or, or getting paid. Uh, Highsmith will get paid here uh, probably at some point uh, next summer. So that's why I would go edge and then trenches to kind of give you the best answer that I could. Uh, Lagoon Tours Bahamas says, oh my god, I get to see a live feed. Wow, this feels like Christmas day. Awesome. Uh, thank you for that. Also says thanks, uh, Alex, for the great commentary. Appreciate that, Lagoon Tours Bahamas. Uh, I promise it's not that exciting. I, I really hope your Christmases are are better than listening to me uh, stammer on, but, but thank you for being here. Certainly appreciate the support. Let me scroll back up and get to some more questions. For you guys to uh, try to answer. Russ Obenstein is here. Good to hear from you, Russ. Hope you're feeling all right. You've had uh, some some health stuff, so hopefully you're good. Says, uh, what's up, Alex and Dave? Good game. Step in the right direction. Lots more work to do. Uh, that's really well summed, Russ. That That is how I would sum this up as well. Good game, right direction, and work to go. That is 100% with you, Russ. Randy Wagner, Alex, I had to miss the game because my daughter got married this weekend. 20 points seems way below standard. Any improvement that I can take away from our offense? Well, first, Randy, congrats to your daughter on the marriage. Uh, that's fantastic. I'm sorry you had to miss the game for it, but I think that's, uh, that's a very good excuse to miss a Steelers game. I mean, for this current team, 20 points is the cap. It, it's the ceiling. They've scored 20 points offensively in a game this year three times. I believe this is now the third time. Also had 20 against, what, the Jets and Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay. So I'm trying to get this team to be bad at blackjack. They're really good at sitting at 20 and staying, but uh, you want to you get past that. So yesterday, you know, you run for 217. You had the ball for almost 40 minutes. How do you only put up 20 points? Well, you're 2-5 in the red zone. You had six sacks. And your kicker missed two field goals, two makeable field goals. And so certainly that's a game where on paper you look at some of the raw you know, box score numbers you need to put up, and you think that you would put up more than 20 points there. Um, but but those are probably the reasons I would look to yesterday as why this offense kind of got stuck on that 20 number again. Uh, certainly some meat left on that bone. All right, let's see what else we have here. Are we stuck with Wright, or can the Steelers potentially sign another kicker? They could. Uh, that's from Todd. What, what happens is is that Matthew Wright was uh, poached off the Chiefs practice squad, and so he has to occupy a roster spot for three games, now two following uh, the Saints game. So even if you cut him, you couldn't sign a 53rd player because he has to occupy that spot. So what 
What you could do is two things. One, you could sign another kicker to the 53. I mean, that's not ideal to have two kickers on your 53 where, where spots are precious, but you could do that. Or, and this is far more likely, if you wanted to, you could sign, say, Nick Skiba to your practice squad and elevate him the next two weeks. And so he gets promoted to the uh, active and active roster on Saturday and then goes back down to the practice squad after the game. Um, you could do that and then have Wright as an, an active player. Uh, I think this team will stick with Wright for at least one more game and go from there. That's my, my sense based on what Tomlin said after the win. It's always better for a kicker to suck in a win than to suck in a loss because when the win happens, people seem to care a little bit less. Uh, let me get a drink of water here real quick, then I'll answer Double HH's question. Given our current roster and anticipated future needs, which current NFL team should be a realistic template the Steelers should emulate? I mean, that's tough to answer for sure. It's hard to look at one team and say, let's exactly follow their plan. Each team's construction and situation and philosophy is a bit different. I've always compared this team to where the Patriots were at post-Tom Brady. You lose a Hall of Fame quarterback. You're kind of going with a veteran for, for a short time. They had Cam Newton, Pittsburgh for a briefer time, had Mitch Trubisky. And then you're drafting that first-round rookie that's a bit more of the older school player, Mac Jones, Kenny Pickett. Um, that's kind of the the summary that I you know, compare them to, the way that I uh, make an analogy to where Pittsburgh's at right now. But again, it's hard to really point them towards one team and say, do that. And of course, the Patriots have had ups and downs and are not rocketing, you know, a year out after Brady and a couple of years out, they're, um, you know, still trying to find their footing. All right, let's see what else we have for the next 20 minutes. Appreciate you guys uh, being here. Uh, Scott says, Alex, out of the remaining schedule, what games do you really think Pittsburgh cannot win? Because I don't see one, especially if this defense stays healthy from now on. Sure, I think, you know, in theory, you can argue why this team would win any game. The, the North games are always close and competitive, and then the rest of the schedule is what? The Colts, the Panthers, the Raiders, and I think that's it. So those are all games that Pittsburgh, excuse me, certainly could win. Um, so, so point taken there, they're not going to win all those games, and Pittsburgh has their own problems. They still got to you know, prove they can be a, a team that even gets to 500. They're three and six right now. That's not where you want to be. But but sure, there aren't there aren't the Eagles and uh, the Bills and the Dolphins where you sit there and say, man, that one is going to gonna take a lot to win. So so I agree with you there, Scott. And then Bob about the kicker, uh, same answer essentially uh, to what uh, Todd said. And again, I think they stick with right for at least one more week. And if that still does not work well, then you play practice squad elevation game uh, instead to replace them. Uh, let's see. Uh, Mike Adesso saying Christian Kuntz is a problem. Had poor snaps almost every game now. Got to bring someone in to at least challenge him. Yeah, I thought there were some issues. He's got that rib injury, and I don't know how much that's impacting him. Center uh, snappers get a lot of protection on the snap, so uh, I, I hear you. I think that's that's a, a valid critique. I don't know if I would be at the uh, replace him stage yet, but uh, I think he's been a little shaky. Ross Swisher says Pickett equals Rosen slash Whedon 2.0, so there's a, there's a commentary there. George, real question, why win and lower our draft pick? Mentioned that a bit earlier because winning means your players are developing, means good things happen on the field, and would you rather have guys develop and play well and things you can you know, take and build upon for next year, or would you rather pick three, four spots higher? I prefer the team collective element of winning because that is going to mean that someone's playing well and that's going to be more important to your future than picking slightly higher in the draft. So I'm always in just in general, it's fun to win and watch this team win. This chat is a lot more cheery right now because they've won a game. Mondays are much better when they are victory Mondays. Let's see what else we have here. Opinion on Matthew Wright in a close game. He'll cost the steals the game. We'll see. It was a bad game. No defending that, but it is just one game. I think Wright's improved as a kicker. His leg strength has improved by remarkable leaps and bounds since he came out of Central Florida uh, when his first stint in Pittsburgh in 2019 and 2020. But, uh, you know, we'll see what happens against the Bengals. I think, you know, he's, he's a guy that he, he's born in PA, grew up in, in, in PA, but he played 
his football in, in Central Florida. Then he was in Jacksonville for last year in Kansas City earlier this year when the weather was nicer. So I think he probably hasn't, I don't want to say that for a fact because I don't know that for a fact, but I think he probably hasn't kicked in many environments like Pittsburgh yesterday where it's below 40 and it's windy and it's a little bit of flurries and there's a bunch of pigeons on the field. So not that I'm excusing, he's got to make his kicks, but um, I think that the environment was a little bit different for him but has to make his kicks, and that's the bottom line. Reed even played yesterday. He and Bush were pretty quiet. Yeah, he played a little bit, but but less is more with Malik Reed. Bush seemed fine. I thought he was physical and sideline to sideline. I mean, no no major mistakes, so I will take that. Why not trade Kenny in the offseason? Um, <laughs> it's not going to happen uh, unless they draft a quarterback, but we're in a division with Lamar, Burrow, and Watson, average quarterback play and playing great defense. is not going to get it done. I agree with the sentiment there, but... Uh, we'll, we'll keep watching Pickett and and see what he does. Alex finally got one right. That's from M. Marcus thirty nine. Hey, I am now four and five on the year. My picks. It's been it, the Pittsburgh's making it easy. It's easy to pick against them when they're playing the Dolphins and the Eagles and the Bills and teams like that. But I am I am now four and five on the year. My prediction. So I am one game away from being flip a coin. So you better watch out. Uh, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll see how next week goes against the Bengals. Uh, let's see. Is a 20 point cap because of the offensive calls, execution or both? It's a mix. I think lately and over the last month or so, it's more execution than the the schematics and the design, but, uh, it depends on what you're talking about and, and you know, what play called or what game or what moment you're referring to there. Uh, Lagoon. Let's see what else we have here. About 15 minutes left. So be sure to get your questions in. And again, thank you guys for the super chats. Uh, let's see. Legion of Weebs kind of want Will Anderson or Jalen Carter. First round O-line inside backer with the next two picks. Yeah, I wouldn't be mad at that. I think Anderson's going to need to have a, a top five pick minimum to get him. I think the quarterbacks go early with uh, Stroud and Young. Probably Young before Stroud, I'll say. But that's my guess. I'm way too far out from, from predicting that. And that'll drop Anderson a bit. But I think he does not. Uh, escape the top five when it comes to Will Anderson and Carter. Certainly they would look good. He was uh, the best defense alignment on that team last year when they had Walker and, and Davis, and everybody said, watch out for this Carter kid. Now everybody's talking about Jalen Carter. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Can we bring the Pigeons to the Baltimore game? Yeah, that was, uh, that's why I like playing on grass, though. I mean, I, I love the environment of it. I saw the big push from the NFLPA and the players to ban turf. I'm not going to pretend like I'm an expert or authority figure on much of anything, much less turf versus grass, but I've always been a pro-grass kind of guy. Um, I think there is some data that shows that turf injuries increase, and I just think it's harder on your body to play on turf. And I think football was meant and born to be played on grass, and it should be played on grass. I know it's... Uh, more costly, and you know the field can get torn up worse. But uh, I am a pro play on the grass kind of guy. John, Alex, do you think this offense can be better with an offensive uh, offensive minded OC and OLC? Um, I don't know how Canada is not offensive minded. He may not be you know competent enough, uh, you know, good enough, or have you know struggles with the job. But I think he's. An offensive coach, as is Pat Meyer, been doing that for a long time. Can they be better with different coaches? Sure. I mean, I think Canada is not not one of the top OCs in football. I think Meyer's done done a fair job, but not also uh, and also not regarded as a as a you know Bill Callahan or a Alex Gibbs or somebody like that. Mike Munchak, obviously. So uh, I'm not. I think Meyer will be here next year. Canada probably not. Although things have not been as bad lately as they were the first you know, five or so games of the season. Do you agree uh, win over Bengals with more improvement on offense could be huge for turning our season around? It's a big game. I mean, you, you win that one, you're four and six, and you start talking about, okay, you just got to win over an AFC North team, and now they're, uh, what, five and five, and you're four and six, and you got a couple division games left twice uh, to play Baltimore. Sure, that conversation opens up. If you lose it, you're three and seven, and we're back to everything sucks, and Fire, fire everybody and, and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it's a it's a pretty big game. Mark Tobin, did Najee get robbed, Alex, out of a 100-yard game because of the fumble? I'd have to check the, the stat on that. I thought, I was hoping the last play of the game they would give Najee the ball. They had that fullback dive to Derek Watt, and it worked, and they converted. So, 
hard to be upset, but now she's sitting there at 99. I said, man, give him one last touch, try to get to 100, but I don't know um, how the fumble impacted things. It may have, Mark. I, I, I don't know, but I want to say he probably didn't, but I would have to check that, Mark. Uh, Lagoon Super Chat not available from the Bahamas. That sucks. I can't support. I don't. I didn't realize there was a country base, but that's okay. Don't worry about that. That's uh, no obligation to Super Chat, but that your questions and your presence, Lagoon, certainly enough uh, for, for the chat here tonight. Um, yeah, Ross, don't worry about Super Chat. It's fine. If you can't do it or if it's being weird, I don't want to have you make a mistake there, and I got to try to figure uh, all that stuff out. Uh, let's see. Mike, uh, what would be the Steelers' equivalent of the Faith Carry debate? Maybe Najee versus Warren. It's still Carry. Uh, you're wrong about that, and there is no debate. I mean, it's 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 Faith by a mile. So whatever a, a big gap, it's T.J. Watt versus Malik Reed. You know who you pick it. I mean, that, that's how I see the Faith Carry debate. Uh, Dark Shine, the kid. We should bring in a former head coach OC. So I assume that's probably some Frank Reich vibes there. Uh, we'll see. I don't think you have to be a former head coach to be an OC. I think. You know, there are different skill sets and requirements and th things like that. So I don't think I would have that as a hard and fast black and white. They must be anything. But, uh, you know, we'll, as far as I know, Canada is still the OC. And until he's not, my focus is on the here and now. Crispy KP, of course, referring to Pickett, had some weird throws. But I'd say 10 starts before I start judging him too harshly. I'll, I'll watch the rest of his rookie year in totality. The good and bad has been both and... And we'll go from there and see where it started and where it ended up. And, you know, that's the way I'm approaching. I'm analyzing, not uh, concluding, is my very quippy phrase. Analyze, do not conclude right now with Kenny Pickett. Let's see what else we have. We've got about 10 minutes left. How did William Jackson pass his physical? I mean, it's not it's not black and white for, for team doctors. They can, you know, pass or fail and... You know, different doctors can have different opinions. So they probably felt like the back injury was pretty minor and wouldn't be a big issue and cleared him. And then he gets out there and practices for a day a couple weeks ago and it, it doesn't feel too good probably the day after. And they realize, okay, you got to sit back down. So, I mean, it's a fair critique I mentioned about all the strange medically signed players over the years. Ladarius Green, Brandon Boykin, who had that bad hip chronic issue that uh, this is what the Steelers claim they had that he, that he had. I think Boykin denied it, but whatever. And then William Jackson. So get the critique there, but uh, physicals are not always black and white, and they're evaluations by doctors, and and that's that. Not a single person in here is capable of being an NFL GM or coach, says Todd. Yeah, that's fair. I assume that's commenting on somebody else. How about Jeff Saturday? It just makes me think Saturday. And, and hey, kudos to him for getting that win. I, I, I want to root for Saturday to do awesome and just have this great run because that would just be be really hilarious and uh, pretty funny. Logan says, O-line improving but must be addressed with some draft capital. Talented tackle group this year. Could you see them drafting a, a tackle high and moving more to guard? He's a road grader. Yeah. You know, Moore's a good run blocker. He's a hard worker. And just moving a tackle to guard, it's just a big transition, and that's that's asking a lot. So maybe um, I think to to replace more a tackle, you want to get like a guy that you think is going to be a stud tackle, like a blue chip cornerstone guy, you know, the next Rashawn Slater, somebody like that. So unless you have a really high pick that you spend it on, I think you stay with more for another year. And then you really look at left guard is kind of where I'm starting. But I understand your point of let's try to fix both by drafting the tackle and moving more to guard. I get it. And if they did draft a tackle really high, that probably becomes an option. But I just don't know if I feel great about that. But it's run blocking. You know, he, he pushes his weight around. That, that's for sure. I just think with more, you know, he just learned his technique to play tackle from Meyer than moving him to guard where your sets are totally different at guard than tackle. I think it might do more him uh, more harm than good. Do I think left tackle is priority in the draft? Uh, like I said, I think left guard is probably where it starts if you have the opportunity to, to, to draft you know, a great left tackle or what you believe and hope will be a great left tackle, then then that's where you would make the move. Um, you know, I think that Moore could become an above average left tackle at his best, but is he ever going to be a great you know, left tackle? Probably not. He's kind of more in that Calvin Beecham, Villanueva tier of player, not the same type of player, of course, but I think he's kind of that caliber at a ceiling. A better run blocker than Villanueva, but, you know, where he's sitting there in that, I don't know, top 12 left tackles in football is kind of where I think 
Uh, his max could be top 10 in a in a best case scenario, something like that. But I like more. He's improved a ton. Uh, his independent hand use has really been fantastic, and it's I think it's really helped him out in pass protection. So um, more has made strides, and he's a hard worker, and, and still it's just a second year guy. Uh, let's see what else we have here in our last 10 minutes with you guys. If you just like the stream, even if it doesn't bring people in now, it just helps promote uh, the channel as well. So thank you guys for that. Uh, what do I think about William Jackson being on uh, injured reserve, used goods? Yeah, 30-year-old corner with back issues. He's not coming back next year, at least not at that number. Not that whatever they're going to owe him, $12 million or whatever the number is. Um, I don't really see William Jackson coming back in... Any scenario that does not uh, come with a, a giant pay cut or somehow a, a far less money. Didn't love that trade, but it's they, get, they end up giving basically nothing besides paying the guy. I just think, you know, whenever you're a first-year GM and you make a trade like that, it's, it's not great for your reputation. You just kind of look a little dumb there. Um, now he made a great trade, Omar Khan did, for, for Claypool, so that the, the, the cost-benefit uh, is, is working in Pittsburgh's favor. But uh, when you're, whenever you're a first-time GM and you're trading for an injured guy, I think other GMs say that, and that we might try to, to get that guy. And Omer Khan, whenever he talked with uh, Pat McAfee weeks ago, closer to the start of the year, said you know, that the GMs kind of try to test you, and that they want to see who you are, and they'll kind of give you a, a low-ball crap deal just to see if you bite. And, and so when you trade for William Jackson, you know, a guy that's hurt and gets put on IR, I think other teams going to see that and say, hey, let's see, whenever we talk to Omar in the offseason— Maybe we can try to, you know, swindle him again. But again, I don't mean to to rant about that too much. All right, what else do we have here? Uh, how do we feel about Minka and Casey up top and Edmonds at a dimebacker role? Edmonds is good against the run and decent in coverage. They were actually using Edmonds as kind of a more traditional and true dimebacker in dime packages yesterday for the four or five snaps they ran it. So. Not going to be an every down thing, but we'll see how it looks whenever Minka comes back. I just want those guys to to get back and get healthy, um, and get this group together. I mean, Watt and Minka played 64 snaps together this year, so I just want to get to a point where Cam and Watt and Minka are all healthy, all playing together, because that has not happened often this year. But when it did, the Steelers' defense was amazing. What is Moore's weakness? Um... Yeah, that's a good question. I was trying to think about that some as I as I evaluate him more. I I, I thought last year dealing with with power, dealing with bull rushes, um, his anchor probably needed some work. I think it's better this year. In the summer, adjusting the Pat Meyer scheme, uh, his punch was a mess. It was terrible. Uh, his independent hand use, he wasn't even using it because he didn't feel comfortable. But that's gotten a million times better. It's actually pretty good right now. So you know, what is his weakness? I mean, he's not the most, you know, incredible athlete around the edge. I think his feet sometimes go dead. I don't know if there's one glaring thing, though, and he's still a young guy that's improving. But I just I just don't think he has that, you know, franchise cornerstone left tackle vibe to him. And I hate to use the word vibe because it's so ethereal, but I just don't think he's the next, you know, Marvell Smith uh, minus the, the back issues that, that Marvell had. Uh, let's see. All right, Russ, what should we understand? I think, you know, you can comment, but I think we get the picket thing is, is pretty clear. And let's just all watch and, and, and see what happens there about, uh, about Kenny Bick. And maybe he turns around and has a great second half of the year and, and we're all having a different conversation there, but I think we're all, you know, aware of the stance there. Uh, let's see what else I have. I five minutes left with you guys not seeing any other questions, but if you want to get one in here last second. And again, check out the site. Got some film rooms. Got some conversations on Heath Miller, which was a really good podcast with Ben talking stories about uh, their time playing together, which was a lot of fun. Let's see what else we have. Uh, let's see what's going on. Yeah, I don't mean I'm not trying to be mean. I mean, you can say whatever you want in the comments as long as you're not, you know, blatantly threatening or being disrespectful. I don't like to kick anyone out because of that, but. I don't want to, you know, have the same conversation a million times over and over. We're just talking about is Kenny Pickett good or bad. Um, we're all gonna watch him together. We're all gonna, we're all gonna see what happens. And listen, I've been pretty critical um, of Pickett the last two weeks. I think I've been certainly more uh, critiquing than I have been praising Pickett's play. But I'm just gonna kind of, you know, wait and see, and not not try to die on that hill every single week. We're just gonna evaluate as we go along. 
Uh, Alex, has any college players caught your eye that Jonathan has been discussing? I still don't get too in tune with the draft stuff, but I think in the name I can't pronounce, so I'm sorry about that. But uh, the left tackle from Penn State, he's what, 19? I think he's 19, first-year starter. I don't even know if he's going to declare after this year um, because he's so young and a first-year guy. I mean, is he, does he want to go back to school? But uh, Fanishu, whatever his name is, uh, sounds, sounds like a guy that I want to watch and get eyes on. Uh, I'm seeing some of the Senior Bowl invites, and so that's exciting. I, I'm going to hope to be back at the Senior Bowl in 2023, but we'll have to to wait and see. Um, but I really haven't. The one guy I would mention, I did this in my um, best case worst scenario, you know, article that I do in the summer that just total make believe, but just for fun. Jack Campbell from Iowa. I know that offense has been miserable, but uh, I feel like Jack Campbell is the Steelers type of guy, well rounded guy, physical, good size, and of course he's basically wearing a Steelers uniform right now. So. Uh, I think Jack Campbell is the guy that if Bush does not get retained, that you're going to hear about some as a day two candidate uh, come draft time. All right, let's see if there's anything else here left for you guys. Um, any other last second questions I can get to? And if not, we'll begin to wrap things up, and you guys can see an archive version of this on SteelersDepot.com. But uh, I'll answer one or two more if uh, anybody has anything else they want to uh, throw in there. Claude Bishop says Pickett will get better, a lot better. Rooting for that, but we shall see. Maybe he does. Maybe I mean, I'm sure he will get better. It's, it's just to what degree and, and what's the, uh, the the level of play there. Yeah, Todd. Yeah, Jack Campbell. Uh, and yeah, so Miles Jack to, to Jack Campbell would be would be something. Uh, Dead Planet, would you design any plays that use Pickett's legs going forward? Uh, I mean, some of the zone read stuff, quarterback sneak stuff, occasionally as a changeup. I think that can be effective. It has been effective, but, but probably not too much in terms of him actually running the football. You got the, the sprint outs and stuff like that that they do, which I have mixed feelings about, very much mixed feelings about. But but they're using his legs just fine, and he's running and creating uh, whenever things break down or things are not there. Uh, Legion of Weeps, $5 Super Chat. Had a great time for my first live session. Love the podcast. No nation better than Steeler Nation. Y'all have a good night. Thank you, Legion of Weeps. Appreciate your being here. Hopefully you can join us two weeks from now when we have our next live stream with Dave and myself. But uh, yeah, Steeler Nation, fantastic. And appreciate the, the, the support. Um, you guys are, are awesome and, and make all of this possible. Uh, Alex, any centers got your eye uh, in college? Not right now. I think Mason Cole is done, you know, uh, Pretty respectable job. He's played hurt the entire year. His entire foot is just tape. I mean, that's all. He just gets a big bowl tape each game that he puts on it. So uh, we'll see. Not you know, certainly you're gonna upgrade Cole at some point. But I, I just have not. I just don't watch the college game even in general a lot because Saturday is kind of a kickback day, or I gotta get groceries or go do something to be an adult and all that stuff. So I, I don't try to spend my Saturdays all locked in on draft stuff before a, a game where I'm gonna be locked in on. On the game, uh, yeah, I, I like I like Cole at, at center probably more than guard right now. To be honest, Ross Swisher, I think he's fine there. And you know, if you're gonna do something at guard, go go with a bigger upgrade. I think I think left guard is where I start the conversation to really try to find a dude at left guard. I, I Dotson, he's got the talent. I mean, he's got size. He's physical. When it comes together, it looks good, but. He's just a frustrating guy to watch on tape with his technique and inconsistency, and there's always there's always something going on with Kevin Dotson. So, I, I think if you're if you're gonna make if you're gonna start making moves, and you should, I start a left guard. That's where I begin. All right, we're gonna wrap, wrap up the stream here. Um, again, Dave will be back uh, for the next stream two Mondays from now, and we'll see where Pittsburgh's at. We'll have played two games at that point, or I think actually, hold on, I think two streams from now is gonna be the Monday night game against the Colts. So. I don't know for sure. I'll have a, a, a message in the community tab. We may do a stream next week and then skip the Colts because that's going to fall right ahead of game time, and that's kind of messy. So we may do one after the Bengals game on Monday. I will let you guys know. Um, that's my thought right now because the 28th is going to be that Colts game. So I think we'll probably, and then Dave can come back and he can talk as well. So I think I think tentatively plan for the 21st, and we'll go from there. So appreciate you guys watching. Um, you can watch this back on the channel or on Steelers Depot. That'll get posted here in a little bit. Appreciate it, you guys again. I have a video tomorrow on should be TJ Watt. Excited for that one. So check that out on 
the channel. Be sure to subscribe if you have not already, and we'll talk to you soon. And I'm going to change this up here a little bit because the uh, I'm, I'm trying to get a bit better at my outros. But that, that was not a great outro, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to fix that. So, again, thank you, guys, and we'll talk to you soon.